live here with Ski. Super excited to have him on the show. Um, I'm really, really a huge admirer of his work. And I just like to highlight um, amazing people and just kind of the things that he's done in his past career and how that's cascaded. Uh, we're going to start joking around a little bit because some of the stuff that he did in the past, I wish I wanted to do when I was a kid, you know, kind of get into the um, get into the sectors that he was focusing on. But um, but Claude, you know, thank you for popping on, you know, being super generous with your time. I know you're really, really busy. So I'm um, excited to have you on. It's so good to be with you, Joel. I mean, it's funny that you said uh, you're really, really busy because I always joke that everyone in New York always says they're busy. You ask them yeah. how they're doing. Oh, I'm busy. I'm busy. Mm -hmm. There's no other city where the default response when you ask people how they are is busy. <laughs> yeah. I guess maybe maybe we, we work in busy circles and we mm -hmm. work with people who are always busy. Or is that something that you've noticed as well? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think so. But you know what's funny, though? Like when you say you're really busy, um, you know, if something is exciting, You'll move your schedule yeah. around. And like, that's one thing yeah. that I learned, you know, we, we're both community people. We build, you know, ecosystems. And, and um, you know, one thing I've noticed is if you have, this is kind of a tip that I've given some emerging managers. Like if you're putting together some type of community event and it sounds super irresistible, like no matter how busy people are, they'll move their schedule around and try to go to that event. Um, so that whole busy narrative like changes if, um, if something irresistible happens or something exciting happens. And that happens to me too, you know, I'm busy, but hey, if I get to chat with Claude or somebody interesting, then um, then you make it work. Well, yes, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, it reminded me of a book that I absolutely love and I've actually got as a gift, as a present for so many friends over the years. It's Flow by the Hungarian uh, American uh, psychologist, Mihaly, uh, Sixth Mihaly. And he talks about the, the psychology of optimal experience, right? Mm -hmm. And how sometimes you can be busy working and you're so much in that state of flow that you don't even realize that it's like 2 a.m. and you're still working mm -hmm. and you can still keep working on it for two or three months, yeah. um, you know, and, 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 and that mindset for months and months. And it's almost like he, you know, one of his quotes is like, attention is like energy and that without mm -hmm. it, no work can be done. And then yeah. doing work is dissipated. We create you know, ourselves by using energy in the right way, I think he said. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that's always really been really important to me because I find that when I'm in that state of flow, I operate on such a higher level. And mm -hmm. that's what, what I've been seeking throughout my career. You know, the challenge, that, that excitement of, you know, doing something that is difficult enough, but not too difficult that it's unattainable. You yeah. know, uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Last Sunday, I ran my very first marathon here in New York and you know 26 miles is very difficult mm -hmm. uh, and I had trained by doing two 20 milers in preparation for Sunday's race but yeah 20 so much more difficult than 20 but it's not so difficult like 35 that you can't do it you know and that's yeah. kind of like how I look at my life and work right now is the kind of challenges that I choose to take on it's like it can't be too easy but it can't be so difficult that it's pie in the sky in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I got a couple of things to jam on with that. So there was, you know, so I heard of flow because there is a pretty well-known private equity investor. He does buyout named Graham Weaver. So he's like all over the internet now. And uh, there was a, yep. there was a podcast with him. I guess he's, he's got, I think his fund now is like 15 billion in assets. Um, and he does straight up, you know, buyout investing, but he mentioned the book flow and I think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think, look, there was a saying that I heard the other day where, you know, we spend when we're kids, we spend our time trying to be older. Right. We're like 15 years old. We mm -hmm. want to be older so we can party and and have fun and be old enough to drink. And then and then when we get older, we're spending all our time and resources to feel young again. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we make all this <laughs> money, you know, and then we make all this money. So and, and a lot of times when you make all this money, sometimes you sacrifice your health. And then you make the money mm -hmm. and then you use that money to to hopefully stay healthy and pay for pills and all that stuff. So we're so busy, I think, worried about the future. Some of us are traumatized by the past, but like the state of flow is really kind of like thinking about like enjoying the present. Like this weekend, you know, I spend time with my kids. Um, you know, my son was doing um, ice skating in Bryant Park and I was kind of consciously thinking about it. I was like wow this is like I should really be kind of enjoying this time instead of kind of worrying mm -hmm. about you know his college tuition and all that which you know hopefully you'll figure out in the future but um 
but you know we we spent a lot of time i feel and i don't know what, what you know how it is talking to your people in your circles but there's a lot of worrying about kind of the future and hey am i gonna you know be wealthy enough and all that stuff um but you know a lot of the joy is kind of like today you know right now yeah i, I mean to close the loop on that because what you're saying really resonates with me you know one thing i've learned is um you know what, again, uh, that state of flow, which is like this motivation that involves being fully focused on the situation that you're in or the task that you're actually handling at that very moment. One thing I've learned is if I'm with you on this podcast, I do not want to be checking my phone while I'm doing mm -hmm. that because yeah. I want to be fully present and fully in the moment because, mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be some important message that flows through, right, uh, while we're doing this. And mm -hmm. it's the same as being with your kid you know, when they notice that you are focused on something else, not fully focused on them, it ends yeah. up altering the relationship. And that's a real problem in our contemporary societies, I feel, mm -hmm. because we're multitasking, we're stressed out because there's so many notifications coming about the Hamas, um, you know, Israel war. Mm -hmm. There's always something so urgent that is kind of grab our attention. And mm -hmm. I feel like that leads to a lot of stress. You know, yeah. that leads to a lot of stress. I want to be in that zone where I'm doing what I love with the people that I love and I'm fully mm -hmm. focused on doing that with the people that I love. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, you know, this is a great preamble to kick things off, you know, just enjoying the moment, enjoying the moment with you, Claude. But let's take a step back and learn about who Claude is. You know, tell me about your family. Tell me about where you grew up. What did you study? And, you know, tell me how you landed to where you are now. I know a little of it, but I want the community to hear it. And um, I want you to take you take us on this journey. Well, it's a um, it's a it's a uh, it's a real pleasure and honor, really, to be on this podcast with you. And in sharing my journey, I have to take it all the way back to Togo because I was born in Togo in West Africa. And I grew up in a really um, interesting uh, environment because my parents, who were never married, uh, were from two totally different socioeconomic backgrounds. My dad was a rising star in Togolese politics. He was a finance minister when I was a, a kid growing up in Togo. Two of his uncles had been president of Togo. He himself was very ambitious in what he's aiming for higher office. And my mom, however, was a seamstress who didn't have any sort of real formal education and was really kind of struggling. Um, mm -hmm. And so I ended up, you know, spending my childhood, my sister and I navigating those two worlds of privilege and poverty on a weekly basis. And I always say that that really shaped my whole perspective on life and relationships and friendships and family, because those experiences that I, um, that I kind of went through as a child allowed me to be comfortable in any environment. You know, so now I'm comfortable with my billionaire friends. I'm comfortable in the slums of Togo, in the shanty towns of Rio. I could be comfortable in white communities, black communities. I'm comfortable in Tokyo. I'm comfortable in Soweto. And when I go to South Africa in, in Johannesburg, when I'm also comfortable in Rosebank, the, the upper mm -hmm. middle class white neighborhoods. And that allowed me to relate to pretty much anyone without kind of um, feeling like, I was an imposter in that environment, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so when I ended up, you know, uh, growing up a bit, um, my dad had a swift fall in politics and he lost all his power. Uh, you know, he was destitute. It was really difficult. And by the time I was a mm -hmm. teenager, when I was 12, I moved uh, to, uh, to, to Paris and went to Catholic boarding school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, a, uh, you know, a very difficult time because it was a fall from grace for my dad and my mom was still kind of struggling in Togo. But, you know, we would only see our parents once a year in the summer, my sister and I. And so I ended up, you know, not growing up around my family and I would see relatives on the weekend sometimes. But I really just grew up in an all boys Catholic, you know, boarding school outside Paris mm -hmm. and dealing with racism in a, in a very deep, fundamental way. And, and that racist experience that I had in that Catholic boarding school led to a discovery of hip hop as mm -hmm. liberation, you know? And so I discovered hip hop when I was a teenager and I fell in love with hip hop and hip hop culture. And after I graduated, um, um, I went to a, 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 an elite university in Paris and then went to London University 
I had started a, a, a magazine, a monthly hip hop magazine when I was in my uh, early 20s because I wanted to document this culture so I could feel that hip hop was going to be an important subculture that ended up influencing global popular culture, mm -hmm. not just New York popular culture or urban popular cultures in major metropolises like Paris, London, and New York, but that would go mainstream. So mm -hmm. after I launched that magazine, Trace, in London, I moved to New York when I was 27 years old mm -hmm. to launch that magazine here in the United States, here in New York City. And again, I always talk about how I came to New York. I didn't know anybody in New York. I was a destitute, uh, penniless immigrant who was living hand to mouth, really struggling as an independent media um, entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. I, by then, I was a, a both editor and publisher of my magazine, selling advertising, chief bottle washer, doing everything, writing stories, uh, recruiting photographers, just really struggling to pay my bills every single month. And living that New York story, living on Avenue C, Alphabet City, with mm -hmm. a bunch of drug dealers and just kind of seeing like pimps and prostitutes and crackheads on the street corner all the time. It was yeah. like a very difficult environment, that New mm -hmm. York um, entryway for me. But then I found a way to build relationships with certain people who became the arbiters of black culture um, in, in New York. And, and, and that led to incredible editorial coverage, uh, you know, with a lot of discoveries of new musicians and, 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 and new actors and new singers who were writing that hip hop wave and looking at how hip hop was not just about music, but it was also about fashion and film and art and technology and increasingly just, you know, mainstream culture. And yeah. on the back of that, I was able to secure um, a $15 million investment from Goldman Sachs, who invested in, in, in my company when I was um, uh, around 30 years old. And that was a big, um, big victory because, yeah. you know, as a first generation founder, you know, I didn't have any founders in my family. And no one told me, oh, this is how you grow a business. This is how you negotiate a Series A term sheet. You know, I, I literally had to make it up as I went along and figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I was extremely lucky that I had a couple of you know really great friends and new business partners who kind of joined my journey as an entrepreneur and we were able to grow this business and um we actually sold uh, that company trace in 2010 and at that time i just decided to become an angel investor i started um, entrepreneurship programs and, and a couple years later i started teaching at, at harvard at the social innovation and change initiative as a way to help the next generation of founders um, do their thing. And I was really always yeah. focused on, on uh, founders of color and also women founders because I felt like, you know, underrepresented founders really had something to say. And so I started investing in their companies, mentoring them. You know, they would come to my workshops, my lectures, my classes, and just launching accelerator programs and, and just really also doing a lot in Africa. You know, as part of Barack Obama's mm -hmm. Young African Leaders Initiative, I started building entrepreneurship programs uh, for the Mandela Washington Fellows, who are kind of the elite uh, young African leaders that are selected by this, uh, by this program, and just really enjoying life, producing films, and just really having a great life. And then yeah. we'll pause there, but, but two years ago, two and a half years ago, I got a call from Dick Parsons, who had been a longtime mentor since, back in the, since he was the CEO and chair of Citigroup. And actually, even before then, back when he was the, the CEO and chair of Time Warner, um, mm -hmm. you know, which was around the time that I had raised money for my own startup, uh, this Trace Media Venture that I mentioned earlier. And I had built a relationship with him over a 20 year period. And he said, well, you know what? We should join forces uh, and launch the Equity Alliance as a fund uh, to invest in other funds. So in a fund of funds mm -hmm. model, uh, investing in VC funds that are run by women and people of color and also having um, a, a pocket of capital within the fund to back the most promising startup founders within the portfolios of the funds that we've backed. And that's how the Equity Alliance was born in, mm -hmm. in, in, in 2021. And of course, unlike Graham, we don't have $15 billion under management. We, we chose <laughs> to start small. Uh, we started with a $25 million fund one. We actually ended up oversubscribing that and launching a fund one at 28 million, 50 million for our fund two. Sure. Yeah. Well, you did a really good job kind of going through um, the entire, the entire, you know, career history and kind of how you built the business and 
and really scaled it to be successful. Um, there's a couple of things that I was kind of thinking about, you know, and, and what, what I was alluding to earlier in the intro was about, um, you know, my interest in music. You know, I my personal journey, I was, you know, learning how to play the drums. I learned how to play the drums listening to Led Zeppelin and Metallica. And I thought I was going to be in a, in a rock band at some point. And uh, my parents kind of discouraged it. You know, I've kind of vented about this several times on multiple episodes. So people are probably going to, um, you know, highlight that and give me a hard time about it. But, you know, it's interesting how music still kind of follows you back. You know, I mean, uh, with, with the Fund Accelerator that I launched, I've met so many interesting people that have been in the music space. And, you know, I've been able to kind of slowly get back involved. I've started taking a few music production companies. So I think, you know, sometimes things happen for a reason. And, and um, even if what you want to do doesn't happen when you want to, if it's meant to be, it'll kind of come at the right time. Um, so like, you know, I want to know a little more about your time in Paris. So, you know, there was some hip hop culture there. What were some of the hip hop influences? Um, you know, can you can you tell us kind of who the the artists were at that time? I'm trying to think, was it, um, you know, what, what? Yeah. What year was this? Was this in the 80s or the 90s? I guess who were who were their biggest influences in Paris? And what were some of the biggest differences, obviously, besides just rapping in French um, in terms of like the musical style and kind of the lyrics and and all that stuff? I'd love to know kind of about that rap culture and hip hop culture in Paris. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm, we're really going to get into it now. So <laughs> this is uh, the stuff that really shaped me. So back yeah. when I discovered hip hop, this was the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I moved uh, from Paris to London in 1990. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's sorry, 1991. Sorry. And I was 20 years old in 1991. And um, in the 80s in Paris, actually in France, not just Paris, because Marseille was also a really big city for hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, there were a few bands that came out and many of them had been influenced by a show that was literally on primetime show every weekend uh, on French television, TF1, the major uh, state owned uh, broadcaster. Um, uh, and it was called uh, hip hop. And we would say mm -hmm. H -I -P -H -O -P, that's spelling H-I-P-H-O-P in French. Mm -hmm. And that show, had a lot of New York luminaries coming on all the time. People like Africa Bambada became uh, luminaries. They were coming from New York and mm -hmm. kind of paving the way for a new style of French expression. And a few bands came out of that hip hop era. <clears throat> One of them was from Paris. It's called NTM. Uh, they, they became really, really big. Uh, and another one from Marseille that I mentioned earlier in the South, uh, mm -hmm. they were called I Am, I A M. So those were two of the big bands back in the day. And then from there, um, around the time that I decided to move to London, um, mm -hmm. there was an, a, an MC who kind of just came out of suburban Paris and made a lot of noise because he made, you know, French hip hop a lot more uh, palatable to mainstream audiences. Mm -hmm. His name is MC Solar. S O um, L double A R. Mm -hmm. And he uh, created a couple albums that were big hits and that kind of really touched on the French love for poetry and using like French style poetry with kind of hip hop vernacular, mm -hmm. uh, French, French slang, specifically Verlon, which is when we were growing up, Verlon was a specific um, way of, of speaking by inversing the syllables. So mm -hmm. uh, Joel would be would be well El Joe. So we would pronounce the mm -hmm. L before the Joe. Yeah. Claude would be De Clo. And he used to really bring the new expressions of French language that were coming mm -hmm. out of um, you know French youthful rebellion into mm -hmm. uh, uh, poetry and into hip hop and, and and creating that with just very kind of simple boom bap original rap and that yeah. became extremely popular. So those yeah. were the, what I would all call my contemporaries, mm -hmm. the people who kind of ended up shaping the new generation of French MC culture. And then mm -hmm. in the 90s, it became really, really mainstream. Yeah. And France, uh, towards the late 90s, early 2000s became, uh, you know. It's like Tupac uh, and Biggie. You know, that's like the 1994, 1996. Exactly. Bill Clinton, exactly. Tupac, Biggie. Like that was kind of, that's what I think about in those years. So that's kind of when it really blew it's, up. Yeah. Yeah, but then, but then what happened was a lot of the American MCs would come to Paris because yeah. France by then was the second hip hop nation after the mm -hmm. U.S. And they would perform in Paris and sometimes freestyle with French 
uh, rappers and you mm -hmm. would have the like, French and English together. And when yeah. I became a magazine uh, editor and publisher, mm -hmm. I actually did a deal with Virgin Records to wow. produce a three different um, records called Le Flow. Uh, Le Flow, oh, see, like Le Flow that we just talked about at the beginning of yeah. the episode. Uh -huh. Le F L O W that were um, MC Solar with Missy Elliott, you know, collaborations mm -hmm. between French MCs and American MCs. Yeah. And that was just great. Those three records did really mm -hmm. well because I think it was a way for me to bring my love for hip hop uh, mm -hmm. from a transatlantic perspective and get MCs from both uh, sides of the pond to collaborate. And so those yeah. were just wonderful, wonderful projects for me. I mean, even in the 90s, it was really cool to just see R&B be mixed in with um, with hip hop, too. Right. So you got a lot of the R&B artists um, kind of doing a solo or kind of having a track on top of the on top of the hip hop beat. And, um, you know, what what I really appreciated with Kanye, this is like 2000, 2005 Kanye. Um, yeah, you know, the late, late registration. You know, what I loved about him was, you know, he would get different artists right he'd get like someone from Coldplay or maroon five to be mixed in to hip-hop which i didn't see earlier but just kind of seeing just a lot more creativity with just different genres and like mixing that into hip-hop and then just kind of his style of just chopping up the um the sped up records right and kind of having that um you know turn into a new track i mean I've seen, after that, you know, I've seen Kygo uh, have kind of interesting tracks where, like, he'll take different snippets of, like, a voice and, like, kind of make that a beat. I don't know if you kind of noticed that in some of the um, some of the tracks that, like, Ky Kygo has done. But, um, but I guess what are some other interesting, just because you're a music lover like me, like, what are some interesting kind of um, innovations that you've seen in, time, in terms of, like, the music style? Obviously, we've got trap music that's been around for the last few few years. Um, and then, you know, I've been following some stuff on TikTok and Instagram um, that actually has mentioned Afro beats. So they got like um, uh, Afro uh, beats and then there's like a harmony on top of it. Um, but like that's what I've observed. I would love to hear like what you've kind of heard in terms of like new types of styles and just what's what's exciting to you. Well, I guess the music that I've loved mm -hmm. and that I ended up writing about and covering when I was a magazine editor, um, was very much like the kind of food that I love. It's, it was very much always driven by fusion. When I yeah. talked about MC Solar and how he kind of brought French poetry mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, you know, hip hop, boom bap kind of beats the hip hop in France, you know, I love the clash of cultures. Mm -hmm. And the record that really, and that's the main reason I decided to move from Paris to London as a 20 year old is a record called Blue Lines by uh, Massive Attack. I don't know if you've ever read, heard that record. Massive mm -hmm. Attack is a British band from Bristol in England. And mm -hmm. they were kind of using electronic music, fusing it with hip hop and with a specific kind of rhyming and singing style that was extremely original and not trying mm -hmm. to be like a New York MC style. So yeah. I've always loved music that is very much a fusion of different mm -hmm. forms of art of musical art forms and that's why i spent a lot of time covering um gangstar and guru's jazzmatazz record mm -hmm. you know which was like hip-hop and jazz and yeah. then i spent a lot of time with mary j blige when she was kind of anointed the queen of hip-hop soul mm -hmm. you know that you mentioned earlier that fusion and yeah. then what happened was when kanye came along he really and this is when I kind of knew Kanye and hung out with him back in the days that you mentioned, 2004, 2005, 2006. Yeah. Um, this, he really found a way to uh, create incredible music that was very much about selecting the best of different forms and but still rooting it within the rhythmics of pure hip hop yeah. and, and expanding the barriers of, of hip hop as a result. And that was a really fresh take on producing. Mm -hmm before he was even known as a rapper. You know, yeah. Kanye was an extraordinary producer before he became an oh, MC. Oh yeah, I remember that. So, exactly, right? And so I've always spent a lot of time, uh, you know, with people who were breaking boundaries, exploring different art forms and pushing themselves. I remember I, I'm still, and I was very close to the Wu-Tang. Uh, Riza mm -hmm. just uh, made the music for my new film, uh, Blue Carbon, that just came out two weeks ago. I've also mm -hmm. produced documentaries, but that's another conversation we'll have later maybe. Um, Riza, who created the Wu-Tang, you know, I remember being on tour with them, you know, Rage Against the Machine. So mm -hmm. I love how, okay, now 
rock and hip hop would come together and explore new kinds of collaboration, how the audiences that, you know, would kind of mingle and be a little bit more curious about the evolution of their various art forms and how mm -hmm. they could cross pollinate. Yeah. That was, I was, I was just was so obsessed with that. And I guess that kind of speaks to my whole theory on life as well is mm -hmm. never being stuck in a box and always navigating different circles and not ever wanting to be defined by somebody else's categorization. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite songs by Kanye, um, and this goes back to, you know, I really love the, the harmony side. I mean, it was impossible. I don't know if you remember that song. It had Keisha of Cole. Of course, I do. And Twista. Yeah. And I just remember yes, that remember video. And that well. was amazing. Just like the, the drum beats that were there. And then just kind of like, he had Twista on there. Then he had um, Keisha Cole kind of singing the, uh, uh, the, the chorus. But that was just uh, probably one of my favorite songs. Then, then the Jamie Foxx song, the, the first one um that, that you know put jamie <laughs> kind of back into r&b because remember he used to be on the jamie fox show right and then he yeah he would exactly. sing every he would sing every once in a while on the show and you know he was known to be a singer he sang in church and then you know i guess kanye and this is the thing there's so many parallels in life right so when when kanye was a producer he's sourcing talent just like a vc would be sourcing great founders great people great partners I mean, he would be like, look, I want Jamie. Jamie's got the voice. Twista can, you know, rap really fast. And you're kind of like this person that is, um, you know, sourcing people to kind of put out the great outputs. Uh, you know, so so many parallels with uh, with like, you know, we're, we're going to get into portfolio construction in a little bit. But but um, I've just seen so no, many parallels in life. Oh, no, I'm so glad you mentioned Jamie Foxx. Because a lot of people don't realize what a gifted singer he was. I mean, that mm -hmm. album he put out uh, around the same time, around that 2004, 2005 time, that album Unpredictable, mm -hmm. um, which which also featured, yeah, it, 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 right? You remember that, right? It had mm -hmm. Kanye on the song called Extravaganza. Mm -hmm. It was like... Is that, that the one with Blame It? Just, is that with T-Pain? Or is that the it, one it is, it is, yeah. exactly. It's the, I think it's the one with T-Pain, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean... Um, it's, I think maybe T-Pain was a bit, was the one after. Uh, anyway, it was around that same time, mm -hmm. but you know, he had great collaborators. He had Timbaland who was doing great work for Missy Elliott at the time. Mm -hmm. It was just like an incredible time for exploration um, around pushing the boundaries of what music meant and how hip hop was not going to be restricted to what people expected it to be. Mm -hmm. And as a result, hip hop ended up broadening its audience you know, via R&B, via pop, via rock, and, and, and also uh, influencing a lot of Caribbean art forms, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and all the way to drum and bass and jungle in the UK, all the way to trap that you mentioned. And, 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 and so, yeah, we could talk about this forever, but I just love how this very small uh, um, uh, subculture from the South Bronx ended up you know, becoming mm -hmm. so huge. And I think it's important that we're talking about that this year as we celebrate the 50 years of hip hop. Yeah, no, that's exciting. And I mean, there's so many parallels to, you know, sourcing talent, right? I mean, you could be an a and artist and what you have to do is you essentially have to find the next star. So if you're, you know, yep. an investor, you're trying to find a portfolio company, you know, hopefully that's a star that's gonna make it worth the time of everybody and the resources. Um, so tell me some of your learnings kind of switching from being an entrepreneur to now being an institutional investor. What are some of the things that you've learned? What are the things that you look at when you look at maybe maybe we could break it out into fund managers and then, you know, founders? Yeah, so um, my, I've had like basically three careers, I'll say. Mm -hmm. So my first career, which lasted 14 years, was my journey as a media entrepreneur with Trace all the way to the exit in 2010 mm -hmm. and the next decade really from uh 2010 to 2020 was really to me just about angel investing mentoring paying it forward uh helping young entrepreneurs do their thing and mm -hmm. i really enjoyed doing that um you know launching these accelerator programs uh, yeah. the entrepreneurship track for Barack Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. That was really rewarding. And I also started teaching at Harvard University about seven years ago. And that was also great because I got to work with, you know, social change makers, young founders, young nonprofit leaders looking to launch for-profit or nonprofit ventures that 
which is basically more make the world a better place, looking for societal change. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really looking to become a founder again, launch a new venture. I was just really, as I said, happy producing films and podcasts and having fun teaching and angel investing. However, uh, when Dick Parsons called me, as I said earlier, and said, let's start the equity lines, I, was, I really thought to myself, well, what, do I, what do I bring to this table? I'm not an investor. I mean, as an angel investor, I've never been like a VC. Mm -hmm. You know, VC is a skill set that I don't have. But then I thought about a lot of the VCs that I've met. And in the conversation that we had about, you know, kind of growing, scaling businesses, they, they, they had, you know, they had a, a theoretical understanding of what it was, but they had never done it. Yeah. They never knew what it was like to have to make payroll mm -hmm. and, you know, bootstrapping the way we did. You know, they have no sense of the stress that comes with being a founder, you mm -hmm. know? And I was like, you know what? I feel like because I've experienced the pains and the joys of being a mm -hmm. founder, I can actually throw my hat in the ring and actually be a PC by leaning on my experience as a first generation founder in an environment where black men are not supposed to raise money for their ventures. Yeah. Black women are not supposed to raise money for their ventures. Latinos and Latinas are mostly excluded. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in the club, then you're not taken seriously. And so yeah. I was like, I can do this. And on the strength of conviction, knowing that, you know, I've gone through the entire journey of having an idea, starting a company, building a team, uh, raising money, selling my company, and then advising young founders, there's something that I brought to the table. And the realization that I couldn't do it alone. So I was able to identify a couple of people who really helped me in the early mm -hmm. days. Yeah. Uh, Max Jan and Julia Pagliar, who um, were at that time working uh, with one of our lead investors, Ron Lauder, one of the owners of the Estee Lauder companies, mm -hmm. um, and also a very good friend of Dick Parsons. They were like my team, my advisor, before yeah. I even had a fund. And then I was, when we actually raised capital and were able to kind of build management fees, then we actually ended up recruiting uh, first a principal and now also chief investment officer, Adrian Reese, and who's actually somebody who has experience investing because she had previously worked with Walton Enterprises investing money for the Walton family. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, as you can imagine, one of the big, big uh, family offices in America, uh, sure. you know, she brought the rigor, the process driven uh, diligence to the party, whereas I brought a much more instinctive, instinctual approach to cutting through the bullshit and understanding the addressable market and the mindset of the, of the founder to see how resilient they were, how much grit they were and how they could withstand the pressures of growing an econ a, a, a company in a very, very tough economy. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that combination of having Adam, who I had hired right after he graduated from MIT Sloan, where I also graduated from, um, you know, that helped us to bring three different skill sets to the party and then working under the leadership of our guide and chairman, Dick Parsons, who's one of the most astute businessmen I've ever met. Um, he was not an investor per se, but he was, and probably still is the single most successful black corporate, ex corporate executive ever to have worked in America. You know, so he has great judgment and he helps us to make great decisions when sometimes we're a bit stuck on what the choice points are. So yeah. I feel like those different skill sets allowed us to launch a very small fund Mm -hmm. that it was a proof of concept fund one that would also allow us to punch above our weight. You know, yeah. it, it was like, we knew that we were small, but we also wanted to create a model that others could follow. And so in a sense, the early success that we're seeing with the Equity Alliance is a testament to the fact that we've been able to assemble a team that is really much, really very much focused on this mission, which is mm -hmm. to help to democratize access to capital and to accelerate <laughs> economic mobility in America, you know, and mm -hmm. so with that single minded focus on doing that, there's very few instances where we could ever have any sort of mission creep because we know why we're in this game. Yeah. We're in this game because we're trying to help challenge some of the inequities that have made, that have made the VC world so unfair and, 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 and for so many people for so long. No, I totally agree. And I think, you know, the the strategy that you have, I'm seeing with a lot of other funds in terms of having the direct strategy and also the fund strategy. Uh, because it's also interesting because a lot of the funds have underlying uh, deal flow that's very, very high quality. And, you know, there's obviously 
um, benefits to be part of those ecosystems as well, right? As those funds, they have their AGMs, um, their community networks and their events, you know, uh, that's how we met, right? We met through kind of a, yeah. a common colleague um, that was also an LP. So, you know, you kind of just cascade those networks. So I think that's that's why it's really strategic to to kind of have a fund investment arm too. And you just learn from other people. I mean, you learn from smarter people. So, I mean, uh, on your end, what are some of the things that, you know, you guys look for in, in founders, you know, in, in terms of the business model, maybe the character of the founder. And then, you know, I mean, what, what's exciting is these emerging managers, they're also business people, right? They have to, they have to manage their PL. Um, they have a budget. They're, they're in the business of um, firm building. Um, so what are some of the attributes that um, have gotten you excited in terms of the um, maybe the fund manager selection process too? Right. Um, I love this question and I'm going to try to answer it in a pretty succinct way and mm -hmm. I'll be concise. So we work with emerging fund managers, as you said, but we also work with founders, right, who mm -hmm. are in the portfolios yep. of these emerging fund managers. So the emerging fund managers, what I love is the process of delineating across the board based on their thesis, their lived mm -hmm. experience, and their ability to have a real point of view on a specific uh, potential marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we've invested in some generalist funds and it's just fine. But if somebody's going to tell me that they're launching a fund that's focused on health tech, I really want to understand what makes you really the very best person to be cha challenging uh, mm -hmm. the, the status quo and, and spotting the best yeah. founders and the best uh, startup ideas within the world of, of health tech. You know, and so I don't pretend to know everything, but mm -hmm. it turns out that the majority of our investments have been in fintech, health tech, and, 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 and I'll just call it SaaS. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so a lot of people are attacking these problems, but we also look at people that are looking for the underserved markets uh, that are not being addressed properly. So if there's health inequities uh, and if there's uh, a solution for sickle cell anemia, which you know, affects many, many black people and a black founder is uh, is, is trying to solve this, this this problem. And this emerging manager has spotted and invested in this black founder and really understands what it is that they're trying to do. That kind of lived experience and that kind of knowledge of the environment and the socioeconomic environment and the psychographics of that community is something that we look at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Because of, of the problem is a, a, a lot of emerging managers are uh, not differentiated. You know, I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many managers told me they were solving for the future of work. You know, future of work, future of work. What do you bring to the future of work debate yeah. that is so differentiated, right? What do you know about the future of work and how future of income, um, you know, how all of that is going to change in the next few years? Of course, there's a lot that's written about that. But, mm -hmm. you know, what is it in your experience, in your own personal interest that allows you to have a very, very specific lane that you can own within the broader debate around the future of work. Yeah. Turns out that certain people have figured it out and the ones who've cracked the code, we figured it out pretty quickly. And then, so mm -hmm. once we get to know these managers and we have really strong conviction on them, the work that we do is get to know them so that they can share their deal flow with us and tell us who their outstanding um, uh, founders are. And, you know, once they, introduced us to these founders, our job is to get to know these founders really well before we write a direct uh, 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 investment check into their, their company. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and that is the part that I love the most because as a founder myself, I, 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 I can relate to their challenges. I know the stress that they're mm -hmm. facing. I know they work every weekend. I know I used to work every weekend, you know, yeah. every single week. And I, I just know uh, that they're on this hustle, you know, and I mm -hmm. can tell the ones who will stop at nothing to achieve their goals so long as they are in a market that has that is large enough, that, you know, sufficiently large addressable market to solve a big enough problem that we can get a pretty huge return on our investment. I'm mm -hmm. pretty good at spotting those. And that's how we were able to spot um, Samir Goel and Wimimo Abbey from Isusu, where we invested in their A round back in July 2021. And six months later, in January 2022, they raised a B round 
at a ten billion dollar uh, at a one billion dollar valuation. Sorry, that's wow. me being uh, that's a Freudian slip. That's an ice B. <laughs> still an ice B. So in this still market, it's still an ice B. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm just saying that because I'm hoping yeah. that Isuzu becomes a ten billion dollar company uh, by the time we exit. So you know. Mm-hmm. And by meeting these two founders who at that time when they were in their late 20s, I could just tell that they were so for real because they were tackling a specific area within fintech and financial Mm -hmm. inclusion within fintech that is about helping renters get on the property ladder and become owners via building their credit score. And that is a very simple proposition Mm -hmm. that anybody could understand, but not everybody could execute on. Yeah. Yeah. I got, so I got three comments, right? So in this market, somebody asked me this, I was on a panel um, in DC a couple days ago and uh, they're like, Hey, what, what are the exciting markets in a recession? And, you know, any market where you're putting money into somebody's pocket, <laughs> especially in these times or saving money, I feel like it's a, uh, it's an amazing business. And it's also an opportunity, especially if you're making, you know, good, good amounts of growing revenue, but you're also putting money in somebody's pocket. I feel like in my opinion, you know, on the fintech side, that's an amazing business in these times. Um, and then another point that I want to respond to is um, just what makes fund managers different. You know, I, I run a fund accelerator and that same point is what I hear often. You know, there could be five climate change funds. They all look exactly the same. And they, you know, the things that they're talking about sound exactly the same. And what I've also heard from specific LPs is like, you know, the pedigree is so great that it's kind of boring. You know, so, you you know, you, know, we, yeah. we, the, you got a team that, you know, worked at NEA. Uh, they went to Harvard and, you know, they, they're already on their fund too. And they've already delivered DPI. But what's the real story? And I think that's what really um, gets people to kind of want to be uh, behind that person, especially if they're, you know, building a firm, a multi-generational firm. Um, so I think kind of what what's beyond the the initial table stakes, which is performance, track record, pedigree, knowing that you can do the job. Um, and this market has got to be more, right? And I think it's you got to take people on that journey. Um, so that was my res- you know response to that. But then I think one thing that can be done to penetrate, you know, the table stakes is, um, you know, kind of building your own personal brand. So you and I, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this back because you and I were talking about some tools that people can use for, for podcasts and community building. So um, I don't know if you've seen people that have been doing a good job in terms of kind of building their own, you know, maybe personal brand that's kind of tied to the funds brand as well. Cause essentially if you're an emerging manager, you know, you're the brand of the fund at the end of the day. Right. So, I mean, people are backing you, um, so, you know, what, what are your comments in terms of content creation? You know, what have you seen, um, with, with brand building, you know, across, you know, there's a lot of different channels, right? So I'm doing video, um, cause it's just more comfortable for me. I don't do a lot of editing, so this is live, right? Um, uh, but some mm-hmm. people are great at, some people are great at doing blogs. Some people are doing great at doing audio only. Um, so kind of like, what do you like doing in terms of content creating? I know you like doing film production. Um, and, and a lot of like high end, uh, video content, but you know, what do you like doing? And then I guess some of the entrepreneurs or people that are in your circles, what do you appreciate that they're doing as far as brand building? Well, that's evolved a lot over the years because mm-hmm. I started, as I said, as a monthly magazine mm-hmm. editor and publisher. So yeah. every month I would put out a new issue of trace magazine and I would host a party with a cover star, whether it was Alicia Keys or Rihanna or whoever it was. Mm-hmm. And we would just basically document hip hop culture on a monthly basis. And that was mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. After that, when we got funded by Goldman, we were able to launch a television network called Trace TV, mm-hmm. which was very much a competitor, an international competitor to BET, right? Wow. And, and, and that company is now owned by TPG. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's big, uh, you know, I have not been involved in that company since 2010, but I guess my point yeah. is I was very much uh, raised on old media you know, TV, magazines, and I used to do a lot of radio stuff as well. Now, um, I've kind of evolved that. The TV work that I used to do has evolved into Mm -hmm. documentary features, right? So I've produced two award-winning documentaries. And uh, yeah. What were the documentaries um, about? They're both about climate change and how climate Mm -hmm. change affects populations in the global south. The very first one, The Great Green Wall, was very much uh, driven by um, this huge project called the Great Green Wall, which is an 8,000 kilometer wall of trees 
that is being planted ac across the Sahel in, in Northern Africa from Senegal all the way to Ethiopia and mm -hmm. how desertification is forcing populations to kind of get on these rickety boats, try to migrate to Spain or Italy. Many of them end up dying and how climate change is affecting lives of the everyday farmers and mm -hmm. you know how young people can support can feed themselves can support their families and what are the solutions because my documentaries yeah. are always very much solution driven this mm -hmm. new one that just launched a couple of weeks ago blue carbon which is going to be shown on cnn films in in the us and on canal mm -hmm. plus in europe is very much about populations that live in coastal areas and have to deal with mm -hmm. coastal erosion and the solution that are that is a mangroves and salt marshes you know, mm -hmm. how do, you know, how does nature create natural solutions to mitigate uh, the climate disaster? And, you know, that one we shot in uh, Brazil, we shot in, in Florida as well, but we also shot in Colombia and Senegal. So I always look at telling climate change stories from the perspective of, of, of the global south, because I feel like a lot of the climate change issues are always focused on the concerns of people living in the Western world. Yeah. And a lot of my work has been about bridging again, the gap between the Western mm -hmm. world and the global South. And then, sure. so that's that. And then I also have a podcast called Limitless Africa. Every year, 30 episodes that come out every week uh, mm -hmm. for 30 weeks around development issues for Africa. You know, mm -hmm. what is a uh, startup scene in Africa? Uh, what are some of the solutions for the creative industries in Africa? You mm -hmm. know, and that's really rewarding as well because it also it complements the work that I do with the equity lines, which is really about identifying these extraordinary uh, uh, emerging fund managers and these founders that we mentioned earlier. So I love the fact that, you know, I have a pretty good balance between the creative work that I do uh, as a content producer and also the work that I do as an investor uh, looking at, uh, you know, investing in outstanding startups and, and fund managers in the U.S. Yeah, what I've also been seeing, too, is a lot of these celebrities um, and it's successful artists now get into a lot more philanthropy. So I think there's a lot of education. Um, there's a startup called Ocho that is trying to, you know, unbundle that in terms of like, there's a lot of things that are demystified, especially when you come into wealth. And this is good education for family offices of like, how do you protect your assets? You know, how do you set up a trust? You know, you have a business trust, you have a personal trust. So those are all things that I've been kind of nerding out on as well, you know, in terms of like, you know, what's the next stage? Because when you think about your career, when you think about my career, you know, I was I was working in tech, you know, became an investor. But then as you kind of think about your your legacy, your family, you know, how are family offices kind of thinking about their uh, portfolio construction? You know, should they only do real estate and then maybe a small percentage of venture? And then, you know, those proceeds, you got to take advantage of QSBS. Um, so all of those kind of like long-term uh, legacy building activities and kind of like asset protection. Um, those are kind of things that I've seen a lot of, um, you know, successful entrepreneurs and successful investors start to really think about like building their own family office, um, you know, and kind of how, how that's going to evolve. So I don't know if you've been talking to uh, any other like single family offices or LPs in terms of how they're thinking about that, um, because that's a great, way to partner, you know, for them to partner with people like you as well, because a lot of times they need that access to, um, you know, interesting opportunities and trends and expertise that they may not have. Um, so I know that was a loaded question, but. Um, well, it's, it's absolutely not a loaded question. It's almost <laughs> as if you were reading my mind, Joel, I have to tell you, because I've been spending so much time thinking about this because, mm -hmm. you know, when I raise money from my former startup that I mentioned, and that grew into a bigger company. I never knew what QSBS was. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the amount of money I would have saved on my tax bill if I'd known what QSBS was, yeah. I wish I knew then what I know now. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work that I do with founders is tell them about these things that I've learned. Yeah. And, and to be honest, um, now that you know my son is six and he's an only child, my wife and I are talking about how do we set up a trust and how, mm -hmm. you know, how do we kind of plan for his future? Because my dad died. He didn't have any money. Um, of course, I didn't benefit from any inherited wealth, but I would like my son, you know, not mm -hmm. to be a spoiled tr uh, a tr tr trust fund baby, but yeah. to be able to have um, the benefit of kind of what I've worked my entire life building, mm -hmm. as in I do have assets and real estate and investments and, and all kinds of things. And how do you actually structure that? Yeah. It sounds easy, but unless you have somebody 
guiding you through that process, mm -hmm. it, fe it can feel like a maze. And so yeah. it's interesting that it's only now that I'm really starting to focus on mm -hmm. that uh, because I feel like it's extremely important as we start planning for his college years and his future, mm -hmm. depending on whatever, what, what he wants to do. Yeah, there's even creative things. I think there was something that I saw on my feed about Beyonce, um, you know, paying her daughter as an employee. So, you know, there are unique things you can do. Obviously, talk to your CPA. This is not financial advice, but or, or tax advice. But, um, you know, I've seen some interesting things in my feed in terms of, um, you know, hiring your kids to actually be part of your company and, um, you know, do real work. And, you know, there's tax benefits to that, too. And, you know, like you, you see Beyonce's daughter in a lot of her videos, you know, so I can imagine yes. there's some tax benefits to that. Um, but like just yes. thinking about those things, you know, how can you, you know, it's not about like how much revenue and, you know, how much capital can you grow and appreciate, but how can you do that, um, you know, tax efficiently as well? as well I mean, yeah I wonderful I see i'm gonna look that. into that i didn't know about that wow <laughs> i didn't know about that that's so clever paying your yeah. kids to work for you Some people do that i mean specific so they, projects yeah. you give them yeah i mean so yeah and, and there's things they, they can do right they could do some um coordination work they can some people have hired their kids as models uh to do some you know media work you know they do instagram videos with their with their kids and that builds like a lot of authenticity with your audience right so Mm -hmm. um, so I've been, and so I, th I think that's kind of interesting to see how, um, you know, people are people are looking at all these different strategies for for that. Um, what are some? And I know we're at time, but uh, what are some of the things that you've been that you you've learned recently, maybe in the last quarter? You know, we talked about a lot of stuff in terms of just being present. Um, you know, leaning into founders. Um, anything you want to share? Yeah, what I've been learning from our chairman and my mentor, Dick Parsons, is the importance of under-promising and over-delivering. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons he became so successful in corporate America running all these Fortune 100 companies is by under-promising and over-delivering. I feel like sometimes in New York, we're all pushing so hard, all being busy trying to make stuff happen that, you know, it's really important to set expectations yeah. and manage people's expectations as opposed to thinking that just by working harder, just because you're ambitious and you're known for taking on a big workload, uh, you are able to, uh, again, just make it all happen and do everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as someone who has suffered in the past from planning fallacy, I don't know if you know what that is, but planning fallacy is kind of taking on too much and thinking you can do it all and not being able to finish everything that you took on. Yeah. As somebody who kind of suffered from that in the past, I am very careful now to not take on too much and to literally under promise and over deliver on what I took on. Mm -hmm. No, I, I was, you literally read my mind because I actually proact. what if you were going to ask me that question, I've proactively started to deactivate like two or three projects. And, you know, I think, I think you can take them all on because People like you and me will probably just lose sleep and get all the stuff done. But what happens is when you get older, like your health gets impacted and like the quality probably goes down too, you know? So there's kind of like repercussions with, um, you know, not getting a good night's sleep and, and, you know, kind of focusing on your health. Um, so one thing I've been trying to do too is like, look, you know, I, I, I don't work out two to three times a week like I used to when I was younger, but now I try to like just squeeze in that run and I just do it first because once I look at my phone, I'm like, man, I got, let me, let me knock out these tasks first and then I'll work out later. So I've been trying to like put my health, um, you know, first, because you also think about your, you know, as you get older, you think about your mortality, you think about like, you know, you want to make sure that you're around for your kids and, and your family too. So you want to kind of um, be conscious of that too, and kind of be, have that be blended in your flow as, as you're, um, as you're doing all these things. So, um, so I'm, I totally glad. Agree. I'm glad we, we were able to come full circle back to flow as we end this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure, Joel. I really enjoyed talking to you. This has been really Likewise. fun for me. Absolutely. Claude, thank you so much for your time. I know, um, I know your time is very valuable, so thank you. And, um, this would be really a huge treat for the audience. So again, thanks for your time. And, uh, we got some time, I think in the next couple of weeks, so I'll catch you in person, uh, I think next week or the week after. Absolutely. I look forward to that. Take yeah. care. Have right, a beautiful Mark. day. Take care. You too. Bye, Thanks Joel. Everybody. Thank you. Bye.